Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brian Clark, and I'm uh, just here to introduce our speaker. But before that, there is a brief commercial, because <coughs> that I have been asked to draw your attention to various things. I would have thought that everybody here will know that this is our 350th anniversary. I could hardly have escaped your attention. <coughs> but you might not know some of the things that have been going on, and uh, uh, particularly, or, and will go on, uh, particularly, of course, the Summer Science Exhibition, which is uh, larger and more splendid than normal ones and is going to be held in the, uh, <coughs> on the South Bank in the, in the Claw Ballroom, I may say, uh, in, in, in the Festival Hall between the 5th of June and the 4th of July. So it's going on for a month. And uh, uh, with different activities, somewhat different activities at different times. So if you want to go, I should check things to make sure that the dates are appropriate. So that is one thing. The second thing that's been going on is... <coughs> the foundation of a new award by the Royal Society, which is the Hawkesby Award, for people who have done specially good things in the way of helping research along rather than uh, doing it, although actually some of the people who've been already received the award have been doing it too, but they <coughs> essentially for laboratory managers and the like, and it's called the Hawkesby Award, because it's uh, named after Francis Hawkesby, who was uh, the research laboratory assistant of uh, Isaac Newton, and who eventually became a fellow of the Royal Society in his own right. So he, he was the, one, of the, one of the first uh, distinguished, uh, technically accomplished people, and uh, it's very appropriate that he should be named after him. Uh, a second thing that's been, third thing that's been going on and will go on are the celebration of local scientific heroes in various parts of the country. So different parts of the country will have different celebrations of local scientific heroes. And I'm sure you all noticed a sudden rash of <coughs> scientific television programs uh, either uh, started or starting. Again, I think, uh, stimulated by this 350th anniversary. Um, I now want to threaten you a little by uh, suggesting to you that you take out your uh, mobile phones and switch them off. And if you haven't done so and it goes off, I would warn you that this uh, meeting is being filmed and webcast and I'm sure the cameras will immediately focus on you if your, if your uh, mobile phone goes off and you will be publicly humiliated. So be warned. The <clears throat> now, it only remains for me, having made a, made a threat, to uh, uh, say something cheerful, which is that I now it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker. And there are some, <coughs> a few words I should say about the speaker, which uh, his name is Andy Purvis, as you, I'm sure you know, and he's professor of biodiversity in Imperial College, and he is an ex-Royal Society uh, University Research Fellow, so he's now, although he's um, is a young lad yet, he seems to have published more than 100 papers. So, uh, I, uh, Young here, is, I should be said, is, is a relative term. So, uh, <laughs> uh, the <coughs> I don't really need to say very much about him because he will be uh, famous enough to you or you wouldn't have been here in the first place. So I will stop saying any more, except that it gives me a great pleasure to introduce him, and uh, he's going to talk about mammalian diversity, past, present, and future. I give you Andy Purvis. 
Thanks very much. Thanks very much for, for that introduction, and thank you to all of you for, for coming. It's a real privilege and a pleasure to be here. Um, as Brian mentioned, in 1995, the Royal Society awarded me a university research fellowship uh, to study mammalian biodiversity for, for five years. And so it gives me great pleasure, 15 years later, to give you a preliminary um, set of results and a sort of status report on how the work's going so far. Something's not working. Oh, it's a pointer. Brilliant. And also, uh, I've forgotten that as this is being uh, filmed and webcast, hello, mum. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm very grateful to the, uh, to the Royal Society for that funding, but also to, uh, to everyone involved in the actual work because uh, a lot of the work I'll be talking about has uh, involved uh, people in my group. Um, I'll be pretending that I did the bulk of it, uh, but that's, that's just to save time. Um, I'm going to start with present-day diversity and then look backwards to where it's come from and then to the future. And um, also, uh, some of you are going to be more involved in this talk than perhaps you uh, intended to be when you decided to come. Some of you will be speciating, um, some of you will be going extinct during the course of the evening. I hope that's all right. But before, before any of you get wiped out, um, why should we actually care about mammals anyway? Well, here are some, uh, some examples of things that mammals do in uh, natural systems. This is where I try the pointer and blind somebody. There we go. So this, this wildebeest here, it's a, a grazing herbivore. Um, and it speeds up nutrient cycling. So it takes nutrients out of the grass, and then it's about to, as you can see from it lifting its tail, it's about to recycle them. Uh, they fertilize their own food. Now, lots of, um, lots of scientists, celebrities, sports people talk about putting something back into their community. But wildebeest actually do it. And in the Serengeti, experiments that remove them from plots and exclude them find that excluding them halves the the amount of grass that grows in the plots and halves the diversity of flowering plants that grows there as well and reduces the, the butterfly uh, population densities by about 90%. So they have big ecosystem consequences where they're found. Here's another example of a big ecosystem consequence of a big mammal. This is elephant damage. Um, elephants and other uh, mega herbivores prevent ecological succession. They keep habitats in grassland that might otherwise sometimes go into forest just by physically breaking the trees down. And so they act to increase habitat diversity. But it isn't only the big species that have big effects. Many rodents disperse lots of seeds, very important to, uh, to the plant diversity. And this picture here is taken in Silwood Park, where I work. And this fence here is to keep the rabbits out. The only difference between out here and in there is that rabbits have been grazing here, and so they've prevented the ecological succession. So many mammals like these are important ecosystem engineers. They have seriously big effects on the places where they live. Now, as well as natural systems, many wild species are very important as a source of food to people. So John Farr has estimated that in the Congo Basin alone, there's at least 4 million tonnes of wild meat a year taken out of the, uh, of the forest there. Now, some of this bush meat hunting, as it's called, is commercial. So this isn't from Africa. This is from Sulawesi. Uh, so here, these people have managed to get enough money that they're now uh, a commercial enterprise. They have a, a truck, and they're off getting the wild pigs from the bush. But often... The poorest people in the poorest countries are depending directly on wild mammals for a significant amount of their protein. So they really matter to a lot of the most vulnerable people. As well as these ecosystem benefits we derive from mammals, they're very important culturally as icons. Generations of children have loved the Jungle Book, so many generations that I can show this picture of the first edition without infringing copyright. So some of the pictures that I'll be showing a bit later on, including the next one, are copyright, and so anyone watching online will, um, 
uh, I'll be getting their own programs, I'm afraid. So that starts here with another icon, a more recent one. The, uh, the Lion King shows off the charismatic megafauna of Africa. And as in the Jungle Book, all the big stars, all the main characters pretty much are, are the mammals. There's one bird, Zazu, here, but he's just light relief. He's the comedy character. So India and Africa, these charismatic megafaunal mammals, what about closer to home? This is the best we can manage. So it, here, um, Ratty and Mole, they're, they're a bit nervous about meeting Badger. Badger is our largest native carnivore because Badger's sometimes a bit grumpy. The baddie in Wind in the Willows, it's not a lion, not a pack of hyenas, it's a bunch of weasels. Now, it wasn't always like that. If you go back about 10,500 years, then here is uh, a picture of the, of the mammalian fauna. Of, in fact, this is a, a site in Yorkshire called Star Car. And here we have aurochs, the ancestors of uh, the wild ancestors of cattle. We've got elk, beavers, wild pig. Um, we've got wolves over there. You know, they don't get a bit grumpy. They get properly cross, this sort of thing. But all of these have disappeared through a combination of climate change, hunting by people, and also habitat loss as people have taken over the landscape and started using it for their own purposes. And this combination of problems now threaten about a quarter of mammalian species with extinction, including all of these. Well, actually, not including the water buffalo. That's not threatened at a species level, though, though the outlook for this individual is quite bleak. And as well as the threatened species, 20 species went globally extinct in the last century. Perhaps most famously this one, the thylacine or marsupial wolf, uh, so this is the, the last captive individual, Benjamin. She lived in Hobart Zoo, um, despite the name Benjamin. Uh, this is a picture taken in 1933, the, the very last captive thylacine basically waiting to go extinct and, yawning, bored of waiting. There are still occasional sightings of thylacines reported, but they are increasingly by unreliable witnesses, and they mainly take the form of I was coming home late one night, and I saw the thylacine. The most recent one I was able to, uh, to trace, um, the person was very sure on their way home late one night that it was a thylacine they'd seen, uh, but they were surprised that it was smaller than they'd been expecting and less dog-like. If anything, it looked quite like a tabby cat, but it was definitely a thylacine. And the officials investigated, and they uh, concluded that uh, it might have been uh, a tabby cat. So... What I want to do now is look at large-scale patterns in mammalian diversity. Where do they live and why do they live there? So there's nearly 5,000 species of mammal on land, uh, and this is where they live. I'd like to thank Rodolphe Bernard for, uh, uh, for putting this map together and also several others that I'll show you. Um, darker colour on here means more species. So... Most diversity, most mammalian species, are concentrated in the tropics. Oh, and I have a hand tremor, who'd have thought? Um, but it's not a simple band all the way across the planet. There are three main concentrations around where the Andes join the Amazon basin, around the African Great Lakes, and in the Himalayan chain and down into Southeast Asia. So why should... Some places, like these, have so many more species than other places, like us. There's three particularly important things. The detailed reasons can get very complex, but three things are preeminent. Energy, landscape complexity, and area. I'm going to take those in turn. So that's the diversity map. And this is the map of plant productivity. So this is the energy that goes into and supports ecosystems. Darker areas, more energy. Now, tropics are off to a head start here because the, the sunlight is hitting them at, a, at, at a more, um, uh, an angle closer to, 
um, 90 degrees, so you get more sunlight per square meter of ground, so it's hotter. But in order to get plant growth, you also need it to be wet. So where it's wet in the tropics, then you're going to get a lot of primary productivity. The dry zones here, like the deserts, you're not going to, even though it's hot. So the plant growth is not only food for the mammals, but also forests are structurally complex. So they provide lots of different places where different kinds of mammals can live. So you get more species where it's warm and wet. But as well as that, here, darker colours are higher altitude. So there's the Tibetan plateau with the, the highest mountains. Mountains increase diversity where it's warm and wet, but not where it isn't. So if you climb a mountain, it gets colder as you go up. And if you're in the tropics, that means that as you go up, you're going to be getting different sorts of plants living at different heights on the mountain. And they're going to support different sets of mammals. But if you're in the Arctic Circle, and you foolishly should... I don't know why anyone would, but anyway. If you're in the Arctic Circle climbing a mountain, there aren't going to be that many plants even at the bottom. So warm, wet and mountainous are particularly good things. And then the, large one is, uh, the last one is area. This map shows biomes which are regions that have much the same climate and so have similar kinds of plants and animals living there. So the bright green one here, that's tropical rainforest. Uh, this yellowish one here is savanna. And the equator, real test of the hand tremor here, is going along through there. It's usually a straight line, actually. So the north and south hemisphere tropical rainforest join up in the Amazon to give you a great big tract of it. And the northern and southern savannah join up in Africa. So you have these really big areas of the same biome type. And bigger areas can support more species. They also make it easier for one species to split into two, speciation. So warm, wet, big and complex all promote high mammalian diversity. Now that's species number, which is what we usually think of when we're talking about uh, biodiversity but I'm just going to show a map of another kind of diversity, which is how different from each other the species in a place tend to be. So that's what this map shows. It's, it's the variance, a measure of how different things are from one another, in log body size. So where that's dark, you have a big range of size of mammals, and lots, lots of them being very different from one another. So... We have the Lion King, Jungle Book, Wind in the Willows. Okay? So African and Asian diversity isn't just lots of species, but those species are also very different from each other. So that's a very quick overview of present-day diversity. I'm now going to turn my attention to um, how that's come about. And there are two main ways that researchers use to look at um, that sort of question. The fossil record... Or, or the tree of life, the family tree showing how species are related one to another. And a few years ago, a group of us put together a tree of life for all of today's mammals. And here it is. Uh, I'm not going to be asking questions later, so don't worry too much. Uh, this is, you can download this still, even now, from the BBC News site. I was so, so pleased. Um, so this is the family tree, then, of all the mammal species that are around today... Um, another word for family tree is phylogeny. Um, we are here, hopefully. Yeah, I think so. Um, right here we've got the monotremes. There's just a very few of those. They're in black. You can barely see them. They're the egg-laying mammals. Then these golden ones here are marsupials. And then we have four superorders of placental mammals with increasingly horrific names. So in the purple here, we have Afrotheria. Then the yellow is Xenarthra. Green is Laurasiotheria. And then the red is Uarcontagliares. I think this shows that the people who make, make up names for mammalian groups shouldn't. <laughs> now, also, this here is a time scale. So the most recent common ancestor of all the mammals was about 166 million years ago, we think. And because we have a time scale, we can look at the origins of present-day lineages through time. And in particular, 
This dashed circle here, 65 and a half million years ago, is when the dinosaurs died out. So we can look at what effect that had on the diversification of present-day mammals. So before 65 and a half million years ago, dinosaurs dominated terrestrial ecosystems, and it's thought that they suppressed mammals. They, they, they preempted the, the niches, and they, they occupied those niches, so mammals were, were basically just sort of stuck in a corner. Here, um, here's, here's a dinosaur suppressing a mammal. Um, with events so far in the past, uh, we, we need to use artists' impressions, and, and artists vary. Um, then, 65 and a half million years ago, a very large asteroid hit what is now Mexico and caused a ma mass extinction, after which mammals inherited the Earth. Um, so what might we see in the tree of life as a, as a sort of reflection of these, uh, these events? This is a slightly complex slide, but I'll, I'll talk you through it. So there are three scenarios shown in the different colours. And the first graph in, graph in the top left here shows how the number of species, n, increases through time if species go on giving rise to species which then give rise to more species without any kind of limit. And that's known as exponential growth. And the key thing about exponential growth, the way you can tell whether you've got it, is you have a constant doubling time. So going from 10 species to 20 species takes the same time as going from 20 to 40, 40 to 80, 80 to 160, and so on. So on this second graph here, the n axis is plotted that way. So here the difference between 5 and 10 is the same as between 10 and 20, is the same as between 50 and 100. And on that transformed axis, exponential growth gives you a straight line. Okay, so that's... That's our diagnostic. That's how we know when we've got it. And here is a phylogeny grown on a computer under that model. Most of the branching points, the nodes, are near the tips, the, the sort of present day, but that's just because that's where most of the branches are as well. So this second column, this is um, a, an, accelerating, a, an acceleration model. So at 10 time units, the speciation rate, the rate with which species multiply, increases. Quite hard to see it in the curve, but if we look on this graph with a different kind of axis here, we can see the increase in slope at 10 time units. So we have a slow rate, for instance, before the dinosaurs died out, and then maybe a quicker rate afterwards. And the phylogeny would look like this, with the nodes more concentrated towards the recent end. And then the final possibility is maybe there's a constraint, there's a limit to how many species you can have. The world fills up with species. You can't have any more speciation. So then the doubling time increases and increases as the number of species rises. And so you have a curve, a downward curve. And when you look at the phylogeny, that would put all of the nodes nearer to the origin of the phylogeny and not so many near the present day. So if we take that mammalian phylogeny with a time scale and we plot the number of lineages it has against time in the way that it's done in the middle row here, then do we see an acceleration? Do we see, when the dinosaurs die out, mammalian radiation taking off? No. No, we don't. The red line here, the red vertical line, that's the end of the dinosaurs... And here we've got, on this axis, the number of lineages in the mammalian phylogeny that are the ancestors of today's mammals. The blue line is the line for all mammals, so we'll just focus on that one. And through the time of the dinosaurs going extinct, they don't seem to notice. Nothing seems to happen. They only sped up later, starting about 10 million years later. It's possible that marsupials, which are this orange line at the bottom may have radiated then. They took a big step up suddenly. But the numbers are quite small, so we wouldn't want to, to overinterpret that. And certainly mammals as a whole don't seem to have responded. Now, this is a bit of a um, paradox, because the fossil record shows 
lots of new species of mammal forming straight after the asteroid impact. But then the phylogeny, looking at the ancestors of today's mammals, doesn't pick up any new lineages joining the tree. So how can we resolve this? Well, this, this artist's impression of a community from about 45, 50 million years ago shows the resolution. So the picture and the community is dominated by these big things here. So this is a, a, either a carrion feeder or a predator called Andrew Sarkis. Um, here's a brontotheer that it's either killed or found dead. And then this is a, a creodont, an early kind of carnivorous uh, mammal. And all three of those families have died out without any extant descendants. So these groups seem to have radiated straight after the asteroid. But then here in the tree, just hiding away there, we've got a small primate. Down here, we've got a small carnivore within the modern carnivore group. Those are groups that are still with us and that started radiating around the time this picture's set. So it looks as though most of the radiation straight after the impact that wiped the dinosaurs out was in mammal groups that later themselves died out, and the present-day groups radiated only 10 million years or so later. And we'll come on to why they might have done that in a few minutes. <coughs> um, firstly, I, I just want to make the point that the, the 5,000 or so present-day species are shared very unevenly among the branches of the tree of life. So taxonomists classify these 5,000 or so species into around about 20 different orders. Here are 12 of them, um, relatively um, recognisable ones. These are not to scale. Um, moles aren't as big as elephants, and, and personally I think that's, that's a very good thing. Um, now, in a minute, I'm going to show a very different view of these where their sizes will be proportional to the numbers of species in that group. So here we go. I'm going to do that again, sorry. <laughs> Thanks to Tom Ezard for this, incidentally. Ratty and moly don't look so bad now, do they? <laughs> The aardvark up here, there's only one of it. Elephants down here, two or three, depending on who's counting. They've almost disappeared. So there's a lot of variation in species richness among these big groups. Now, would we expect to see as much variation as that if all the lineages have always had the same chances of diversifying? Now, we're going to um, hopefully investigate this a little bit. We're going to do a simulation where all of the lineages do have the same chances of diversifying, and we'll see whether you tend to get very uneven spread of um, species among lineages or whether it's fairly uh, consistent. So as I understand it, in the audience, we have a bunch of people who are, who are aware that at some point this evening they may have to become kangaroos. Is that right? Go on, show yourselves. Do we have any kangaroos in the house? Yes, yes we do. Fantastic. And hopefully also some mice and rats. Mice and rats, brilliant. Good, good, good. Cats, looking for some cats. Brilliant. And also some old world monkeys. Should have some monkeys as well. Don't worry, hand gesture will do. We don't have to do the full mime. So what we're going to do now, we're going to um, have a, a speciation simulation where we're going, to put, going to, we're going to put one species from each of those lineages into the hat here, um, Lindsay, you, you right. Um, and then, uh, do you want to take them to help to, uh, to help people to pick things out? Um, and it's kind of an odd simulation. This Lindsay's now going to ask people to pick without looking, pick a colour out of the hat, right? And that the the lineage whose that colour will have speciated. So you know from your pictures of animals which colour you are. Which colour have we got? Green. Green. So, green. Uh, so, first of all, can we just have one person from each of those four groups standing up, just to start? Okay. So, one from each of the groups, please. Lovely. Yeah. And one more. The last group. Great. So, we... Oh, we've got too many now. Oh, hang on. <laughs> right. Okay. So, we've got one from each group. 
And we're going to now run this simulation until one of these groups has reached eight species. Okay? When, a, when your colour's chosen, then we need another one from that group, just one more, to stand up. So we need another green person now, please. Another green person. Anyone? Go on. And then that means we have two species in the green group who might be able to speciate. So that means we put another green token in the hat. Okay? And so now, hopefully speeding up as we go, we'll pick one out of now five tokens, two of which are green. Okay, so could the next person please pick a, pick a colour? Without looking, please. <laughs> what have we got? Green. green again. So could we have another green person standing up, please? Which sort of animal is green? I can't remember. You, you've got the kangaroos. Right, so kangaroos are off to a great start. And now... Half the tokens in the box, in, in the hat rather, half the tokens are green. So there's a 50-50 chance this time that it'll be green again. Probably won't be now I've said that. But What have we got? It's a green. Right, lovely. So another green, please. Another green. So now, although it's a completely fair thing, the first one could have been any of the four colours... Whichever of these families, whichever of these groups gets off to a good start, now effectively has more tickets in the lottery. What have we got now? No, no, keep going. <laughs> no! What is it we've got this time? Green again? Yeah? Lovely? Lindsay, can you call out the colours? Yeah. So each of these groups is independently doing exponential growth but now, because of this luck that green has got off to a good start, there is no mechanism here for any of the other groups to catch it up. It's now very unlikely that any other group will catch green up. And often, the race isn't even close. Yellow. So, yellow. OK, so another yellow person standing up, please. I'm, I'm very sorry to reds and blues. Um, you're, you're there on your own. So we've got two cats and four or five kangaroos and a monkey and a mouse or rat. And, yeah, any more? Go on. Yep, we, we want to keep going till we get to maybe six in a, in a group. It's a, it's a green again. OK, so I think that, that might do to, to, uh, to show the point that here we've now got, what, five greens, two yellows, and only one red and one blue. So thanks very much to everyone for speciating. Thank you. Six greens. Right, thank you. Thanks very much. So, although it's a random, I think you'll agree, an extremely random process that we've just simulated there, it doesn't lead to close races. It's, it's often going to lead to big differences in species richness among groups. However, although it leads to big differences among species richness, if you simulate that through, we're not going to go all the way to 5,000 species. Um, <laughs> really, we're not. Um, you don't get as much variation when you simulate that process as we see here. You don't get 2,000 species in one order and one in another. Both of those things are too extreme for this, what's called a null model, of all the lineages having the same chances. So some lineages have cracked it. They've worked out what it takes to win at mammals. And others... Have, have blown it, and, and they have something about them that means they lose at mammals. And in an analysis, it, it says in review, and I'll be honest, we haven't yet quite submitted it. Um, sorry, Kate. Uh, we can use the branching pattern that's in the tree to pinpoint where on this tree of life there are branches where the diversification has speeded up, and that, that's a red up triangle, and then also those branches where it seems to have slowed down. And those are the green down triangles. And when we do this, we find 15 speed-ups or radiations and 11 downshifts where the, where the group has slowed down its diversification. And many of the explanations for these are probably to do with the history of how the continents have moved, how habitats have moved around them, and how mammals have moved with them and between continents as well. So... Here are the winners at mammals. So I'll, I'm not going to go through all of the 15, but I'll try and explain what we think may have prompted 
the radiation for many of them. So one of the radiations is carnivores, modern carnivores. So the branch, the, the node that we identify as the radiation is just after the extinction of the dinosaurs. So it's tempting to infer that maybe they simply took over some of those niches that dinosaurs did. And maybe that's true, or it may be that they are very good dispersers, which certainly many present-day carnivores are, and so were quick to move from continent to continent as that became possible. Because before about 55 million years ago, the continents were mostly separate. And then when they joined up, monkeys, which are another of our radiations, carnivores, and also the group containing rodents, quickly spread across all the new areas. Um, also, opossums up here, they reached South America around the same time, probably from a northern continent, um, and they radiated in South America. And also some of the radiations within bats are associated with dispersal. So just as when we look at species richness patterns across geography, when we look across the family tree of mammals, we find that area seems to matter. Reach a new continent and you can radiate and produce new species. And Yale Kiesel and her uh, colleagues have shown that this pattern also holds true with much more recent dispersal events within mammals. Now, at that time, when the continents joined up a bit and lots of these could move, uh, move around among them, the world was a lot warmer and a lot wetter than it is now, and the tropical biomes, tropical forests, reached a long way north and south. And then there was a 15 to 20 million year cooling period and the land got cooler and drier. And lots of the radiations that we date to that time, such as kangaroo rats and squirrels, are associated with um, drier conditions, more xeric conditions. And then the most recent radiations of all in here, uh, jackrabbits, kangaroos, are grazers, which fits with the relatively recent expansion of grasslands much of which has taken place over the last 10 million years or so. So that's the winners. And then these are the, the losers of mammal, uh, among mammals. Um, and there's a couple of generalizations we can make about them, though nothing that explains absolutely everything. So quite a few of these do something a bit weird that they're very good at. Uh, vampire bats, for instance, uh, being specialised blood feeders, uh, beavers, uh, camels have quite extreme adaptations to their way of living. Or they might be on the fringes geographically rather than in terms of their niches. So selenodons here are, are sort of shrew-like things that are restricted to uh, islands. The other generalisation that, that we can make about them is they tend to have long gestations. So it takes them a long time to produce an offspring up to the point where they can give birth to it. So we're speculating a little bit, but it, it might be hard for um, species in these groups to rear young to the point where they can survive uh, a temperate winter. It might, we just, it might be that they just simply can't get them large enough, robust enough to survive a cold winter. There's also, of course, the possibility that, that they might just be a bit rubbish. Um, so being able to fly is really cool. Flying lemurs can't fly. They're not even lemurs. They, they, they glide, and they're rubbish. There's two of them. So, anyway, that's, that's how mammals got to be where they are now. What I'm going to do now is move to consider what future they have. Well, what's the problem? This is some, a NASA picture of the Earth from space, and it shows... We can see the forests. Lovely, we can see those. We can see savannas and grasslands. We can see uh, temperate forests. Um, we can see ice. There's almost no sign of people during the day. But at night, the problem becomes a lot clearer. We're the problem. People, in particular, rich people, frankly, are the problem. So we've converted most of the land you can see lit up there quite intensively towards um, urban uh, environments, a lot of infrastructure there. Um, the biodiversity damage that we inflict, of course, isn't restricted to these areas because these areas export quite a lot of their biodiversity damage to poorer countries. 
but we, we take up a lot of land. We also take up a lot of energy. So I, I mentioned how you can explain a lot of the mammalian richness pattern in terms of area and energy. Well, here's, here's how we, uh, we've used up area in agriculture since the start of the Industrial Revolution about 300 years ago. So black here is the agricultural land. And I'm going to move through 50 years at a time. Um, you can see how the world population increases from a tenth of what it is now, just 300 years ago, how it increases every 50 years to 1990 anyway. So there's 1,700. 1,750. Population at this time is growing at about 3 million a year. There's 1,800. 1,850. It's starting to speed up now, the population growth. And in the most obvious thing in the next 50 years is... Americans going west, young man. So if, if you watch how agriculture spreads into middle America, there we go. So we're now up to um, over one and a half billion. But in the next 50 years, you see that sort of expansion that you saw in North America pretty much everywhere as the population goes up by a further 800 million. And then between 1950 and 1990, the population more than doubled but because of the Green Revolution, it didn't need such a vast amount of extra land for agriculture. So here goes the population to 1990. So we're using up an awful lot of land for cities, but also agriculture. And it's been estimated that people are already using maybe a third of the energy coming into ecosystems. So that means that there's a lot less space and a lot less energy left to support anything um, that, that isn't part of that human enterprise. We're also moving species around a lot. We're uh, introducing species to countries that, where they, they weren't from. Um, and that has the effect, to an extent, of making landscapes less complex. So energy area and landscape complexity were all important for high diversity, so we might expect this to have quite a big impact on nature. And our best way of assessing its impact on mammals is through the IUCN Red List. So the World Conservation Union have assessed every mammal species in terms of its extinction risk and placed them on this, this ladder to extinction here. So uh, uh, least concern, that's what we're after. So species where there's really no hint of a threat whatsoever. But then as we go up this, up this ladder, species are in greater and greater peril. So near-threatened, like the ring-tailed lemur, and then the next three categories are what, what's considered as threatened. So when I say that a quarter of mammalian species are threatened, that means that they're vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. If it goes beyond that, then they might become extinct in the wild, like Pear David's deer here, but still, um, still alive outside of their native range, or it might be that they actually go extinct. So since 1500, 76 mammals have gone extinct. And over 1,000 now are threatened. So a quarter of species could go extinct within a human lifetime unless we're careful. How does this compare with so-called mass extinctions in Earth's history? So there are five famous mass extinctions. Uh, this is the geological time scale through here. The numbers here are millions of years. These arrows point to the extinctions, and the pictures are some of the casualties of those particular extinctions. And then the, the y-axis here is numbers of genera. So a genus is a group of closely related species. It might have um, just a handful. It maybe have dozens of species. These are genera from the sea, mainly from shallow seas, at different points in history. So in these mass extinctions in the past, for instance, if we look at the time where the dinosaurs died out, we lost maybe a third of the genera that were known from the fossil record of shallow seas at that time. Um, this granddaddy of them all, the biggest mass extinction at the end of the Permian 250 million years ago, we lost more than half. So, okay, 
those are in numbers of genera, whereas extinction risk is affecting species. So we need to try and get those into the same currency. To lose a whole group like a genus, it means you have to lose all the species in it. So a little bit of mammalian classification. Um, these are four species in the genus Panthera. Um, to wipe out Panthera, you'd have to wipe out... You'd have to kill all of the individuals in each of those species, so hopefully that's very unlikely. And then to wipe out the next taxonomic level up, the family, here, all of these families are... Uh, sorry, all of these genera are in the family Felidae. So you only wipe out this family when you wipe out all the species in all the genera. So we're going to look now at how severe an extinction episode has to be in order to wipe out whole families or genera. So now I would like, please, uh, I'm going to need five kangaroos, five mice, five cats and five monkeys to stand up, please. It's probably going to be easiest if you're in a group vaguely together. OK? And this simulation, you don't get to speciate in this one. Um, so do we ha now have... So, Lindsay, are there now five of each in there? Yeah, great. OK. So this one, it's, it's more like the national lottery, this one, except you don't really want the big finger to be pointing at you because when it does, then you have to, um, you have to sit down. So we're going to move the hat among here. Again, please choose... Uh, a token out of the hat at random without looking, and then it's going to be easiest if the person nearest to the aisle from that colour, oh no, the person nearest to that end for each colour sits down when one of that colour's drawn. Okay, so can you yell out the colours? Blue. blue. Okay. So, yeah, the blue, a blue nearest the wall sits down. I'm afraid we're we're already down one rat or mouse, I think it was. So that means that now there are fewer blue tokens in the hat. So this, unlike the previous simulation, there's a green, OK? So the green nearest the end there. I'm sorry you've gone extinct. I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, so here, as a, clade get, a, a group gets smaller and smaller, red, OK, OK, um, then it has less and less representation in the hat. It's less likely that the next token will be of the same colour. Green. Green. So this one, we would expect it to be a much closer race. Yellow. Okay, it's working so far. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that one's a bit serious. I think we <laughs> spot a bother down there. Blue. Okay, this is working spectacularly well. Yellow. Yellow, right. So we've still got two yellows, still got two, three cats left. Okay. Blue. Blue, all right. How many blues do we still have? Two. Just two, just two rats and mice. Or are you monkeys? You're monkeys, sorry. Can't see from this distance. It's another yellow. Yellow's down to two as well. Two cats, two monkeys. Who's going to win? Uh, I'm not sure it's winning. Red. red. Oh, down to three with red. Blue. <laughs> That's very nice. Choosing the person sat next to you. <laughs> very good. <laughs> Nothing personal, probably. <laughs> oh, you didn't... Not, not a turkey voting for Christmas there. That's very good. So we're down... So all of the groups are down to only two or three now. I think there's three... Uh, are you mice and rats? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Green. Green's down to one. Just the one. One kangaroo. They won earlier, but they're not looking so clever now, are they? Blue. Blue. Down to one. Have we got any blues, or is that the lot? Gone. Blue's gone. So, okay, so how many altogether do we still have? We've got six left. So we have to lose 14 out of 20 species there 
before any of the groups got totally wiped out. And that was a much closer race than the one where we were going up. Thanks very much indeed for going extinct so nicely. <laughs> so, if we're only losing... Well, only losing. If we have a quarter of species that we might lose if we're not careful, it doesn't look as though that would scale up to a huge number of, of genera or families if, ex if extinction is random. Now, that's a key question. The model we've just simulated is known as the field of bullets model of extinction, and it's a metaphor that comes from the First World War. This is a picture from um, the Battle of the Somme. These are the Lancashire Fusiliers. J.R.R. Tolkien actually served with, um, with this regiment. Um, and the the metaphor comes from the idea that, that basically these people, they're getting ready to go over the top. They're going to be going into machine gun fire. Many of them will die. Whether they survive or die may not have terribly much to do with their ability as soldiers. There's going to be an element of luck, possibly a very large, possibly a dominant element. And so in the field of bullets model, extinction is effectively random bad luck that happens that wipes species out. If that model's right, then any sample of species that we look at will have more or less the same level of extinction risk in it if extinction's random. But that isn't what we find with mammals. So if we map how many steps up the ladder the average species is in different parts of the world, then we see that there are hotspots of risk. Madagascar, Central Asia, for instance, where the average species is really quite far up that ladder to extinction. And we also find that there are groups like rhinos, manatees and dugongs, and also the non-human great apes, where all of the species are threatened. So that implies that it's not just a field of bullets. So why do some species get threatened and not others? The first possible explanation is very prosaic and simple. This is um, also a picture of the Battle of the Somme. Uh, this is the Allied headquarters. These people are probably going to survive the day. It doesn't mean that they're better soldiers than the ones we saw previously. In fact, you'd have to guess the reverse would be true. But nonetheless, their survival chances are better simply because this field doesn't have any bullets in it. So this firing line model suggests that trouble is concentrated in some parts of the world rather than others. So if that's true, then those groups that have diversified and radiated in parts of the world that are now in trouble would have lots of threatened species, and those regions would have lots of threatened species. And as, a, as an anecdote to illustrate this, I'm going to give you now the tale of two rabbits. So... This is an Arctic hare. It's out of the firing line. This is where it lives. Now, some species, you can tell, are destined for trouble. This is the volcano rabbit. <laughs> it's found only on the slopes of four volcanoes. Not any four volcanoes... These four volcanoes on the outskirts of Mexico City. <laughs> there they are. Here's, here's Mexico City. Their habitat is um, being converted for agriculture and also people go from here out to there and shoot the rabbits. So perhaps the difference isn't to do with any, anything to do with the species, just where some live and where some, you know, where some live being safe where some others live being dangerous. And to resolve this, we need to consider whether, if you look at the mammals in a single place, is extinction risk random? Because if extinction risk is still not random among the mammals in one place, then that implies that there's some biological features making some species more prone to extinction than others. So we looked in each of about 700 places, and these circles are centred on those places, and where the circle is bigger than that size, then that means that extinction risk is significantly not random. It's clumped on that tree of life, such that close relatives tend to share the same extinction risk. 
They're either all safe or all threatened. And that would mean that there's some feature of their lifestyles that govern how well they do. So even when mammals are facing the same numbers of bullets, some mammals have lifestyles that make them more bulletproof than others. So rather than the firing line, rather than the field of bullets model, we have a model more like this. So what are the, the lifestyle factors? And where do they matter? So these are slightly um, complex figures, so I'll, I'll talk you through them. Again, circles bigger than that mean that we have a, a significant pattern, something is really going on. This figure here is showing that large body size is bad. It's associated with high extinction risk where the circles are big, and that's basically the tropics. So throughout the tropics, large size is associated with high extinction risk, but not in the temperate zone. Where we have large circles in um, South and Central America and also in most of uh, Europe and Asia, low abundance is associated with high extinction risk, independently of that body size effect. The large circles that we have here in sub-Saharan Africa mainly, late weaning is associated with high extinction risk, again, independently of these other effects. And here in Southeast Asia and also in Western North America, long gestation is associated with high extinction risk. Notice that here, where we are, nothing is bad. We've been left with the battle-hardened survivors. Those species that we had 10,500 years ago, and we don't have any more, they fell foul of one or other of these patterns, and now they're gone. We hunted out the aurochs, the bears, and the wolves. And so now we have ratty, mole, and badger. So if you have lots of babies, fairly often, fairly quickly, you can eat anything and live anywhere, then you can do really well. But if you've got the opposite set of traits, then you're going to need a helping hand in order to survive. So going back to the, the, the Neo model, he is the one. He's not the one. If we expand this out to the global scale, what's at risk? I showed this map earlier. It's how different species are from each other. If you remember Lion King... Jungle Book, Wind in the Willows. Now, I mentioned that at the moment a quarter of species are threatened with extinction. What would happen to this map if we lose those species? So I'm going to do, go through that again. Watch what happens to Southeast Asia and India and South America in particular. We're basically turning the whole world into wind in the willows. So at the moment, we still have a choice. We can carry on reducing biodiversity and end up with the wind in the willows. Or we can try and tackle the underlying drivers of these changes and try to save the Lion King. We have the choice between biodiversity or biomonotony. Thanks very much indeed for listening. Thank you. I won't answer them well, but I'm perfectly happy to try. <laughs> In which case, I will come up and join you, because I, I do need to <coughs> say that if, if you wish to ask a question, will you please make it evident, and then somebody will bring a microphone, and will you please also stand up, because otherwise it, it doesn't work properly. So that if anybody wants to ask a question, please gesture, and we'll, we'll get the microphone to you. And then you, stand, you can stand up and, and uh, get, ask your question. I hope that doesn't inhibit people. <coughs> uh, you said that uh, in some countries, bushmeat is a problem. Is there some way that that uh, can be reduced? Uh, do you see a possible solution to that? 
I think it's very complex, um, and it's, it's not my, my sort of core area of research at all. Um, there are the conflicting demands, uh, conflicting pressures. On the one hand, we would love to conserve the biodiversity. And on the other hand, there's a lot of people there who depend on the protein. Um, and it may, it may be hard to envisage other sorts of protein um, being available. These are often places where uh, it's, it's hard to keep livestock, for instance. I think that um, some practical measures um, are tried in, in different places to, for instance, make um, the, the hunting more selective on species that have the reproductive rates that can cope with offtake. So, so trying to use more selective um, uh, tools in, in hunting rather than unselective snares, for instance, which often catch primates which have very low re rates of reproduction and so can quickly be hunted out. But no, it, it's, a, it's a genuine dilemma. Um, a slightly callous question, but does it matter if we lose a quarter of the remaining species? What's the practical upshot? So, it's a good question. It's a very good question. Um, I think a lot of species in any diverse group have a lot of analogues. They have kind of carbon copies, photocopies of themselves in a slightly different part of the world that do much the same job. So we have 2,000 species of rodent. I'm not saying I think that's too many, but I'm not sure that there's necessarily 2,000 completely different ways of being a rodent. So I suspect that in any... Um, a uh, large-scale system like this, there are species that could be lost without very much impact. But there are other species whose impact is very important on those systems. I showed some examples at the start. Um, we're in particular danger of losing largely the big things. They're the ones that are, are declining most rapidly on average at present. Um, it's not true that only big things have big ecosystem effects, though I suspect that many of the species with large effects are indeed big. So a lot of systems will change. Whether we mind that or not, I don't know. And I think that there are two very different things here. On the one hand, there's an ecosystem service argument for conserving biodiversity, which is increasingly important. We need to conserve biodiversity because of the goods it provides us effectively for free, that would cost us a lot of money if we were trying to get them elsewhere. Bushmeat is one of those. The other one, the one perhaps you're alluding to, is more we would feel better if we can stop something going extinct. The second of those arguably is sometimes a luxury, but the first one isn't. And mammals, as well as their iconic appeal to us, they are also fundamental parts of ecosystems on which we depend. So I think if we let them go extinct, then we may live to regret it. Uh, do you think if the uh, Earth warms a few degrees with global warming, will that have a large effect on the situation? I'm sorry, if there's global warming, will that affect things much? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I would expect that it would do, um, not in a, a kind of linear and gradual way, because I suspect that many mammals don't so much depend on the temperature as the vegetation type. So if you warm tropical forest, it keeps being tropical forest. It manages to maintain the microclimate in which most of the creatures live for a while. But eventually, it won't be able to regenerate. It won't be able to persist. And then you get a sudden switch to another system. So the way that that would... Um, play out in terms of the framework I've presented here is we would see a big reduction in area of a lot of the biomes. That things would change quickly from one system to another and that would lead to a, a big reduction in populations of many species. Thanks very much for a very, very interesting presentation. I was particularly interested in your, your model of speciation and having the different 
colours up there, especially the fact that sort of yellow won out in the, at the end of the day, made me wonder how it could be applied to our current political system, especially with the elections. <laughs> but, but maybe moving on to that, um, we're mammals. Where do we fit into the picture? We're doubling in size, as you've noticed, and yet um, sometimes we, we feel that we're very fragile in terms of our position in the ecosystem. Hmm. Well, I think that that sense of fragility will only grow. Um, at the moment, we have 6.5 billion people. It's predicted that by 2050, we'll have 9, 9.5 billion. It's predicted that that's going to require a lot of currently marginal land to be pressed into agriculture, which will place further demands on natural systems and on agricultural systems and on infrastructure because of the, um, the need for further irrigation, for instance. So I think we're, we're reaching a point where we are going to be very close to the consequences of our actions. So I think we're right to feel fragile. We're right to tread carefully. A sense of trepidation in what we do would be very good. Um, I wish it were more widespread. But no, I, th I think we are approaching a... We have a very fragile system. We've, we've seen in the last few days how even, even as robust an organisation as the Royal Society can be slightly discombobulated just because Iceland has exploded. So <laughs> there's been that, that simple, almost mundane um, event has had serious repercussions on economies in different regions of the world. Now, that's otherwise a natural catastrophe without kind of natural victims, but we can easily envisage um, natural catastrophes, biotic catastrophes, that would have a lot of um, immediate victims. And our actions are bringing us close to the, uh, a sort of critical state, I think, where it, it's, it's hard to imagine the world population doubling again, I'll put it that way. <clears throat> what happens to non-mammalian species uh, in your framework? It's a very good question. So, what happens to non-mammalian species? I've focused exclusively on mammals for two reasons. The first one is that I like them very much. But the, the second one is that we know enough about them to analyse the information in this sort of way. The sorts of analyses that I've put up can't be done for most things because we haven't even described all or even most of the species, much less characterised them in terms of where they live, what their conservation status might be and so on. So I think it's quite likely that large mammals are at the sort of vulnerable end compared with species in many groups. So they have characteristics that make it hard for their population numbers to bounce back. That's not uniquely true of mammals. The same would be true of tropical hardwood trees, for instance. The same would be true uh, of birds. Um, so that there are other groups that may have similarly high levels of vulnerability. Um, we simply don't know as much as we would like to about other forms of biodiversity in terms of how it's doing and also what it does in our systems. But although I showed at the start of this ecosystem services that mammals provide, mammals aren't as big providers of services on which we depend as some other groups, notably plants and insects. So we could do with finding out more <laughs> about the, the patterns in those groups too. We've got three now. <laughs> One, two, three. Um, I was just wondering, because with humans, there's a huge number of us, and we're the only species in Homo at the moment, and there's going to be 9 billion or something by uh, 2050. Why, why has that happened with us? Why, we don't have much diversity in, in the sense that there's just one species mm -hmm. of us. Could you just comment on, on that? Just tell me a bit more about why that's the case for us and not for other species. I, I think it's... Um so, so the, the evolution of, of humanity is a, is a fascinating topic, and there are many 
uh, things that make us what we are and give us the power over our environments that other things don't have. But I think what we're doing now is a very large part of it. We can communicate so we can learn from someone else's mistakes without even having to watch them. So we, we have this kind of group mind in terms of experience. We can learn experiences from people who lived thousands of years ago, from things they've written down. Um, I think that that is... So to my mind, language and, and the power of communication that that gives and embodies is one of the huge advantages we have. It means that an individual has so many more experiences than they could accumulate by themselves. If we wiped out, like, elephants, for example, would humans exactly notice? Would it um, exactly matter to them, except they would feel very guilty? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Um, I, I, I worry very much that we're, we're going to find out. Um, it's, it surprises me that we haven't had more high-profile extinctions in the last 20 or so years. I think it's great, but it does surprise me. I'm very concerned that uh, a number of um, high-profile mammalian species, I don't think elephants particularly, but uh, tigers, certainly, I think they're at risk from, of disappearing completely from the wild um, in, in our lifetimes. Um, will we notice? Yes, we'll notice. Um, will we care? Not enough. So, good question. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I thought it was. Really, I think it's really interesting that um, extinction risk has some uh, phylogenetic components. So, closely related species are more likely or less likely to go extinct. And do you think that's um, mainly because closely related species are similar? So, taking one example, maybe they'd be similarly attractive to hunters. Or do you think there's some inherent um, genetic components of vulnerability to extinction? Right. Um, it, it all has to do with people. So if we look in the fossil record, then, yes, species do go extinct. And over long sweeps of geological time, there are some biological traits that are associated with species going extinct more rapidly than others, even in the absence of any people. However, what we're seeing now is orders of magnitude different. So the average mammalian species probably would normally, without people, have a longevity of about a million years. As there's 5,000 um, species of mammal, that would mean that you'd expect to see an extinction every couple of hundred years, just naturally. A species would just disappear, one every 200 years. But... 20 species disappeared last century, so that's 400 times faster. Now, this century, we're brutalising the environment to a much greater extent than we did last century. So it's, it's how they respond to us. It's features of their ecology and biology that mean they can't deal with what people are doing. to my question, which is um, how the evolutionary principle seems to focus on um, greed, really, and how human beings haven't um, surmounted this. Uh, with other animals, it's not greed. It's they need to survive. But with human animals, we seem to have extended the need to survive into greed. We can't just stay alive. We've got to kill all the creatures that are so beautiful, the mammals. And in the end, it seems to me that we're going to be killed by bacteria because of the ones that we can't kill. I just wonder, really, how you explain the lack of, of um, moral uh, weight in human beings. I, I think that people are very moral very often. I think we often make decisions that aren't at all greedy, that are very altruistic and selfless um, when we think about it. However, we are in a society that 
does require growth. Um, so, so, for instance, I, as a, as a professional biologist and, a, and someone concerned with biodiversity, I'm very concerned uh, that the human enterprise should stop growing. However, when I think about the pension I'd like to have when I retire, I'd very much like industry to keep growing, please, because my, my pension is linked to that. So I think it's very hard for people to wholly remove themselves from societal decisions that we take by a kind of passive consensus, things that uh, they're just too big to fix. I think most of the, uh, the big problems that you refer to, I don't think they're really down to individual greed. I think they're down to just the path of least resistance, if you like. I, I'm tempted to interpolate a remark here to ask the questioner a question and say, if your, you ha your children were dying of starvation and the last representative of its species came, you would shoot it because you want to feed your children. And it's not just greed. Mm. You actually want... I mean, it's a natural tendency. Well, that was my point, really, about mm. um, survival being about the need to stay alive instead mm. of the need, perhaps, to preserve something larger than us, our mm. planet. And I think... Uh, yes, I, I, this is not so, my <laughs> discussion. <laughs> but but I, I think we're the only species that considers trying to do anything larger than itself. It's a responsibility that we need to face up to, but we are the only species that can even conceptualise of such a thing. So I wouldn't say I'm exactly optimistic, but I do see grounds for optimism. Uh, <coughs> I, I think I got a message that we, we had to stop the discussion now because it... Uh, and, uh, I think it opportune moment for me to say thank you very much indeed for a perfectly fascinating talk. Thank you. And, uh...